So, what's going on with all the news about the sun? Some say that the sun is getting angry. Well, what does that mean exactly, and should we be concerned? Frankly, yes, we should be concerned. It's generally not a good thing to get too much sunshine. The ultraviolet component of sunlight is harmful to the skin. That's why humans have adapted a spectrum of skin pigmentation. The more sunlight there is to protect ourselves against, the more pigmentation we need. Big floppy hats and, of course, bottles of high SPF oil-free sunscreen help too, especially for fair-skinned people. But what is planet Earth going to do? First, let's get a good estimate of just how angry the sun is likely to get. The sun usually goes through an active calm active cycle every 22 years, with highs and lows occurring every 11 years. Why that happens, no one knows, it just does. There's probably a reason, but scientists haven't figured it out yet. They do know that, with each cycle, the sun reverses its magnetic poles. That in itself is pretty astounding, especially when you consider that Earth hasn't reversed its magnetic poles in the last 600,000 years. Lately, the sun has been extremely calm, the calmest it's been in over a hundred years, in fact. That's unusual, too. The active calm active cycle has turned into an active calm calm cycle. But that's changing, and it's why we are notifying brightsiders about what to expect in the coming few years. The terms calm or active or angry refer to the amount of high energy radiation that the sun gives off. Thankfully, the amount of visible light the sun gives off doesn't change very much. That would be a serious problem. If the sun were to get just 6% dimmer or brighter, the Earth would either freeze or fry. Observing sunspots is the easiest way to measure how active the sun is. The more sunspots that are visible, the more active the sun is. A graph, known as the butterfly diagram, tracks the 11-year period of sunspot activity. The butterfly diagram shows how sunspots disappear regularly from the surface of the sun and reappear regularly in other locations. NASA predicted that the present cycle of solar activity would be calm like the previous one. But it's starting to look like that is not the case. Presently, we are in solar cycle number 25. That's the 25th 11-year solar cycle since 1755, when record-keeping began. This cycle of solar activity is expected to peak in 2025. The sun has already exceeded the number of sunspots NASA had predicted. So, it doesn't look like this solar cycle is going to be a calm one. It looks like we are going to have some very active sun-blasting radiation on Earth for the next several years. In early February 2022, 40 out of 49 SpaceX communication satellites in orbit above the atmosphere were destroyed by an explosion on the sun. High-speed electromagnetic plasma gas from the sun, known as solar wind, caused the Earth's atmosphere to compress and Elon Musk's satellites lost their orbital integrity and crashed back into Earth. Sunspots look like dark spots on the sun, but they aren't dark. They're just not as bright as the surface of the sun. To get a better idea, take a lit 25-watt light bulb and hold it in front of a lit 100-watt light bulb. The 25-watt light bulb will appear dark. That's the same way it is with sunspots. Sunspots on the surface of the sun almost always come in pairs. This is because sunspots are magnetic storms in the plasma gas of the sun. One sunspot will be magnetic positive, and the other sunspot will be magnetic negative. Between the two sunspots, which can be many times bigger than the Earth itself, there flows an electric current that carries a fiery arc of ionized gas with it. Solar flares are something else we should be concerned about. They are powerful electromagnetic explosions on the sun associated with sunspots. As the super-hot plasma gas on the sun churns and twists, it also twists the magnetic field lines in the sunspots. When these lines snap, a powerful explosion releases X-ray and gamma radiation at the speed of light. Visible gases are also released. Solar flares have a classification system, according to how powerful they are. X-class solar flares are the most dangerous. This type of solar flare can cause radio blackouts across Earth and harm satellites, astronauts in orbit, and even passengers on high-altitude airplanes. M-class solar flares cause spectacular aurora at the North and South Pole areas on Earth, while C-class solar flares have almost no effect on Earth. But solar flares are not the biggest explosions on the sun. 
CME stands for coronal mass ejection, and these are much more massive than solar flares and more dangerous when they're headed our way. As the name indicates, coronal mass ejections are explosions that originate on the sun's corona. They hurl millions of tons of hot ionized gases outward from the corona. The word corona is derived from the Latin word for crown, and it's the layer of thin bright gas around the sun's surface. The corona of the sun is much hotter than the surface of the sun. The surface itself is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the corona is somewhere between 1 to 2 million degrees. The why and how the corona is so much hotter than the surface of the sun is another major mystery that scientists have yet to completely work out. A recent theory claims the corona is heated by sound waves and the sun's nuclear reactions make a lot of noise. Project GONG, which stands for Global Oscillation Networking Group, was set up on Earth to monitor the sound waves on the sun. Cool, huh? Turns out, the sun is ringing, or oscillating, like a bell. And we have five observation sites across the globe. One in India, Australia, one in the Canary Islands, one in Chile, and one in California that keep a constant watch over the 10 million sound waves moving on and around the sun. Now that the sun is entering an active phase, we can expect to see more powerful CMEs heading our way. The gases expelled by the sun are ionized and stripped of electrons by the intense heat. This causes them to form a proton storm that can travel through space at speeds of around 500 miles per second. These positively charged atomic nuclei will mostly be blocked or deflected by the magnetic field that extends around Earth. Our atmosphere is no help against a proton storm, although the last mile of air above the surface of the Earth stops the harmful X-rays from solar flares. The particle wind from the Sun can only be stopped by Earth's magnetosphere. We can look forward to some spectacular aurora around Earth's magnetic poles, and it's very possible that these aurora will extend down to the mid-latitudes when the Earth is moving through a coronal mass ejection. Currently, the United States has a space probe headed for the solar corona. Because the corona of the sun extends outward for many millions of miles, the Parker Solar Probe, as it's called, is cruising 3.8 million miles from the surface of our star, or about one-tenth the distance to Mercury. The probe is experiencing temperatures of 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is also kept at perfect room temperature. A a 4.5-inch thick carbon composite heat shield protects the telescopes and magnetometers in the probe that measure the intensity of the solar wind. The five antennae that protrude into the coronal gases are made of a niobium alloy, which can withstand the extreme temperatures of the corona. The recent double-calm cycle of the sun is a bit concerning when trying to predict how active the sun will get this cycle. The sunspots completely disappeared for a long time from the entire surface of the sun. It is as if the magnetic distortions we usually see on the photosphere of the sun had collapsed into its interior. Intense magnetism is coming to the surface now and breaking through into the corona. The National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, is predicting that this solar cycle, cycle number 25, will be one of the strongest ever. The last solar cycle was very calm, with a sunspot count of only 116. The average is 170. But the prediction for this cycle is between 210 and 260 sunspots, which would be one of the strongest cycles ever. We stand to lose more satellites to a stronger solar wind. We can also expect electric grid overloads as the proton storm peaks in 2025. That means we should expect an interruption to our internet services as positively charged protons get into the wires, run into the transformers, and overload them. On March 12, 1989, a powerful CME hit Earth and created absolute havoc with our power grids. Will we experience anything of this magnitude in the near future? Well, stay sharp, Brightsiders! We've sent more spacecraft to study the local environment on Mars than on any other planet. We have no evidence that life exists on the Red Planet, or ever did. But that didn't stop some people from wondering. Mostly because of the pictures that NASA's Perseverance and Curiosity rovers take regularly of Mars' surface. Feel free to check them out for yourself on the Internet. They're free for anyone to see.
Over time, some odd shapes have appeared here and there in these pictures, making some people believe there is some sort of creatures living there already. Back in 2008, one of the rovers took a picture of a rock that looked very much like a female figure. Other photos seem to show animal-shaped figures, utensils or other Earth-like objects. Again, there is little to no proof of this theory, as rocks can be of all sorts of shapes and sizes. But if you look at the pictures, it does make you wonder. A lot of people in the scientific community do see Mars as a better place for long-term settlements, even though our moon is closer. Firstly, because it believed there is indeed water on Mars. It's just stuck in underground frozen lakes. The soil doesn't seem to be rich in nutrients, and it may have some harmful chemicals. Moreover, on the red planet, the gravitational pull is only 38% of Earth's, so it's easy to carry heavy objects here. On our moon, for comparison, the gravitational force is only about 16 and 16th percent of that found on Earth. We already have people studying how we might live on Mars right here on our planet. It's because certain regions of Earth closely mimic the harsher conditions on Mars. Daven Island, for example, is the biggest uninhabited island on our planet, located in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. It's easy to see why it's hard to live here. The soil stays frozen all year. The eastern part of the island is covered by a thick ice cap all year round. Summers here only last for less than 50 days and aren't really that warm. Not a lot of plants can grow here, so no animals can adapt to thrive and multiply. As such, the Hutton Mars project started here in 1997 to offer astronauts unique studying opportunities. There are few options here in terms of logistics and transportation, and communicating with people living outside the island is also a bit more difficult. All because of the temperature and barren soil. Think about it, if we can find solution to live here, we might be able to do it on Mars too. Regardless of our local training, the conditions on Mars are currently inhospitable. That's because it's really cold. On average, the temperature is about minus 81 Fahrenheit. Even during the summertime, it's never hotter than 86 Fahrenheit. And to top it all off, the planet's atmosphere is made of 95 and 3 tenth percent carbon dioxide, so there's literally no way we could breathe there without special devices. Mars also lacks a magnetic field on its surface, so it is attacked by the sun's radiation. Because of the temperature variations, Mars often experiences powerful dust storms, which can surround the entire planet. Technically, these storms can physically harm us, but the dust might clog electronics and render solar-powered instruments unstable. We know now that life as we know it is impossible on Mars, but did it ever exist there? This is a question long debated by scientists, since NASA's investigations have determined that some parts of Mars were habitable at one point. We don't know for how long or how far back, and just because something could have lived there, it doesn't mean it actually did. Other recent photos from Mars showed a cloudy sunset. Does that mean it also rains on the red planet? Well, not really. For starters, on our planet clouds are water vapors, and once it starts to rain, the water reaches the surface of our planet in liquid form. This process isn't the same on Mars. Surprisingly, there is more water in Mars clouds, but they are made of iced water. Think of them as a tiny icy fog. Combined with the thin atmosphere and cold temperatures, it keeps the clouds from ever falling to the surface. Sunsets are different here too. According to NASA specialists, there is some fine dust that makes the blue near the sun's part of the sky much more visible on Mars, so the sunsets here have more of a bluish tint. Similar to Earth, Mars is also tilted on its axis, which means it also has seasons. Because the southern hemisphere is directed away from the sun when Mars is farthest from it, the winters here are far colder and summers way hotter. Calendars work differently on Mars too. A year here lasts for about 1 and 8800 Earth years. A day is a bit more longer than 24 hours. Even if we were to ever move to Mars, we'd still have to communicate with our Earth. 
it would be a bit difficult to do, since a message sent back home would take about 15 minutes to reach its destination. It's not that bad, given the entire distance, but it would make video calls kind of annoying. As difficult as it might be for now to live there, there is a lot of stuff to see. Some scientists believe that if we were completely colonize Mars, a list of locations would soon be declared national parks, like the area surrounding Olympus Mons, which is the biggest known volcano in the solar system, stretching over 16 miles. Valles Marineris would be another cool location, it's been a huge complex of valleys about the distance from Los Angeles to New York. Mars also has some cool polar ice caps, which sometimes experience dry ice snowfall. Saturn and Uranus are unique planets in our solar system because of their rings. It may not have one now, but Mars may be getting a ring of its own in the future. Don't get too excited, it's estimated it might take 10 of millions of years. Mars' largest moon, named Phobos, will be torn apart at one point. The debris resulting from it will settle in a rocky ring around Mars, resembling that of Saturn and Uranus. Speaking of moons, Mars has two of them, that we know of. Apart from Phobos, there is also one more object called Deimos. Both were discovered by an American astronomer named Days of Hull back in 1877. The scientist had almost given up his pursuit to find Mars moons but thankfully he was urged to continue the project. The next night he stumbled upon Deimos. Six days after that initial finding, Hall found Phobos. These two space objects may be in fact some asteroids captured by Mars gravity. Another theory suggests they formed in orbit around Mars at about the same time the planet came to be. The fact that Mars has a really weak gravity may also be the reason for this fascinating event. Mars was hit by large asteroids many years ago, just like our planet was. A lot of that debris surely went back to the surface, but some of it was ejected back into space, as Mars' gravity wasn't strong enough to pull them back. They had quite a journey, some of them even ended up on Earth. These pieces of Mars also helped us understand the planet's unique features. We've continued to send robots to the Red Planet quite successfully in the past few decades. But it still remains quite difficult to imagine people will soon land on Mars. Even considering the current rocket technology, the journey would take us six months. And that's an optimistic scenario, given everything goes well on board. After landing, humans will be exposed to deep space radiation and microgravity. Both of these have serious effects on the human body, which we've yet to figure out how to counteract. That's why research is continuously performed on the International Space Station regarding the long-term effects of microgravity. It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoarfrost appears on the ground, the grass and the trees, and ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky, and their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky, and the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the Sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the Sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. 
On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the Sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the Sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the Sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the Sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too, either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, 
creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. Despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the Sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the Sun, and even the presence of the Moon in its skies, all of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the Sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay?